Well, actually, I want to start with the point that I wanted to, to make very clear to people about categorical, about axioms, the elementary theory of the category of sets. And I'm, I'm not sure I said it's structural in this, in, in this precise sense. Take any formula in that language that has no constants and no occurrences of, vari of, of the variables s or s prime, and then I'm going to use those variables here. So the point is, well, OK. Let I solve that be the formula saying that those two sets are isomorphic. Then ETCS proves this statement. Given any two sets, if they're isomorphic, one of them has the property if and only if the other did. Now, why do I say no constants? Thought P of X cannot be X equals 1. Of course. Just because something's isomorphic to one, I mean, because obviously one has this property, it's equal to itself, and other sets isomorphic to it don't have the property, and they're not equal to it. But that's too much to ask. That's not what we meant by property. Um, and it had better not be x equals s prime. It better not be x equals s prime, because then this statement won't mean what we thought it did. Because this, the s prime that we substituted in will collapse with the s prime that already occurred. So that's all I'm saying. Take a statement that doesn't talk of, that doesn't name particular things, and doesn't happen to use these two variables. Then ETCS proves this statement. It's not just that we know it's true, the axioms actually prove this statement. For properties that don't name particulars, any two isomorphic sets, if one of them has it, the other does. Now, this includes properties. The theory may not prove whether anything has that property or not. Um, let's take the, so for example, Px could be um, X has the cardinality of a model of, Z, of ETCS. You might be, X has the cardinality of a model of ETCS. Now, ETCS doesn't, it, it can't prove that any set is big enough to model itself, because that would be proving that it could be modeled. You can't prove that. It sure can't prove that there aren't sets like that. ETCS cannot prove whether any set has this property or not. But it does prove that a set has that property if and only if all the isomorphic ones do. So even for properties that we can't prove to settle at all, we do know but if any set has it, so does everyone isomorphic to it. In this set theory, sets have no properties that aren't invariant under isomorphism. No, it's, there are no statements expressible in the language that can distinguish between two isomorphic sets, except by just naming one of them. Of course, if you just name one of them, then. But uh, apart from just naming one, sets here have no properties that aren't isomorphism invariant. And that, I, I mean, that's, uh, that's actually stronger than what Vanasserf asked for. He only asked if the elements have no properties other than relations to each other, uh, which actually follows from this. Yeah, it follows from this that you, you make a similar thing about properties of elements of sets. What is it? Remember, an element is a function from one to a set. We can do the same thing here. Um, let, let this be the statement that says two functions are, are, both el are both functions from one to the same set. That is, there are two elements of a single set. ETCS proves that whenever these two functions are elements of the same set, any property that one of those functions has, the other one also does. Except for properties that involve naming a particular one. Yeah. So in, a, in, this, in this plainest, strictest sense, 
the elements of these sets have no properties other than related, other than being elements of the set they're in and being different from the other elements. The sets have no properties that aren't preserved by isomorphism. So I, uh, I do not know why the structuralists don't say, oh, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, well, they don't because Jeff Holman said that maybe you can't think in terms of set theory, because Saul Preferman said you can't think in terms of, ca of category theory, rather. Saul Preferman said you can't think in terms of category theory, and Jeff thinks he might be right. You can. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, no, but that's, that's way too much to ask. Yeah, we sometimes say in Zermelo Frankel a set is determined by its elements. And if all you mean by that is the Zermelo Frankel axiom of extensionality, it's true. But it's, if what you thought you meant by that was you could always define a set by saying what its elements are, of course that's completely false. Most sets have no unique defining property in Zermelo Frankel. The ones we're used to do, the little countable sets have defining properties. A lot of continuum size sets have defining properties. But there are, provably in Zermelo Frankel, there are cardinal numbers that have no expressible differences between them. We forget what a, what a strong theory ZFC is and what huge things it implies exist. Yeah, um, lots of cardinals already in Zermelo Frankel set theory have no distinguishing properties that can be expressed in the theory. You can prove that by extensionality, one of them is an element of the other and the other is not of it. But you can't express any difference between them. So to ask for the converse, that's, that's, that's just impossible. The, that just reflects, and I wouldn't be surprised if some people that is what they're thinking. There are way too many people think that in ZFC, you can always define a set by describing its elements. This is really only true of, a, of finite sets and a handful of, of infinite sets. Most sets, you cannot define their elements. Now, in the constructible universe, you can define in the sense of constructability, but that involves arbitrary ordinals. You can't define those ordinals in any ordinary sense of defining. So there's definability relative to ordinals, but not definability in any ordinary sense. People, people don't, don't always know that. Well, how do you prove that? Huh? How do you prove this? Oh, um, oh how do you prove this? This statement here? Right. Oh, um, you show that in a parameterized form, well, let, let's first show it as if we've taken particular sets S and S prime. You define a transformation on statements it reverses whatever anyone has said about S to say about S prime. And then you show that each step of those equivalences follows from the axioms. So now you know that they all do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I will tell you that one of the happier weeks in my career was figuring out what this, okay, how do you say this? Is it true? <laughs> yeah, figuring out precisely that problem. It's, it's, it's a, an inner model argument, so to speak. You see, so, and then you show that this works for variance. Given any two sets, we can, we can reinterpret the universe by permuting them, so that if they were, well, if they have to be isomorphic, right. Given two isomorphic sets, we can, we can permute, the, permute the universe around them. Because, so here's, here's what's going on. I'm remembering now. Here I am inside the universe of sets, and I've got my S and my S prime. Now, if they're not isomorphic, this one might be the, the term, a terminal object, and this one might be an initial object, and I can sure express the difference between them. So there's no hope when they're not isomorphic. But if they are isomorphic, then there's some isomorphism. There's some function F and F inverse. So now what I can do is I can reinterpret every function k as k followed by f. Every function h as, as f inverse followed by h. 
I can now, I can use these two to reinterpret every object. I'll interpret every object as itself, except I'll interpret S as S prime, and S prime as S. I'll interpret every function as itself, except if it's a function to S, I'll compose it with F. And if it's a function out of S, I'll compose it with H. And if it's a function to S prime, I'll compose it with F inverse. And if it's a function out, so I, I can define this. This is just a finite description of a permutation. So I, per, I, I permute the whole universe so that only these two got moved. And because the, these, infant, these formula and its inverse exist, the function and its inverse exist, that's well-defined. Well and I show it remains a model. So it preserves all the truths. And my first trip to China was to present this and the analogous statement about category of categories as foundations at the International Congress over at the Yo Yi Ping Pong. <laughs> Yes, yes. Which you can always remember, it's the year before the Olympics. They encouraged lots of people to come so that they could test stuff out the year before. <laughs> you know, no, they did not bring the logicians to Beijing in the year of the Olympics. <laughs> these are these are vague thoughts, but I wanted to talk about them in terms of applications of philosophical logic outside the philosophy of math. Well, look, this project of structuralism, this is not just philosophy of math. In, in all, in all, there's big debates about structuralism and philosophy of science. That's a somewhat different sense of structuralism, but it's related to this one. It is about saying we ought to be able to define things just by the relations among them without dealing with the substance of them. Um, which is exactly how Lavier described the elementary theory of the category of sets the year before Benesno's paper. He said, this set theory will suggest that what matters in mathematics is not, is not the substance of sets, but their invariant form. And lots of philosophy, and not just philosophy, lots of modern art and literature in the last 120 years has been about, about trying to describe structure directly. Well, within philosophy, some of the, I think, you know, people do look at Shapiro's and Hellman's theories of structures. They say, this is philosophic, this is interesting as logic, too. Can we make sense of this? Well, if you can, you can, that's great. But you can certainly make sense of the elementary theory of the category of sets. Um, I, flexibility, what I mentioned on the, the original, flexibility of structure. Category theory just suggests a range of possible structures that people had not conceived before. That's why it was invented in mathematics. Now the structures the mathematicians invented, you don't really want to know a lot about. I'm afraid you don't really want to know a lot about a tau, a, a tau sheaves on a scheme. It's a great subject if you're in algebraic number theory, but it's, it's technical. But believe me, this stuff was invented to come up with more flexible notions of structure than people had had before. The classical notions of group and ring and module, had, had, they'd done great work, they led to great progress, including they led to new demands. They demanded to be made more flexible. Instead of talking about rings, we want to talk about whole families of rings varying. Instead of talking about spaces defined by an equation on a field, we want to talk about varying families of spaces to find on varying families of fields. And we, I say we, like I'm part of this, well, mathematicians wanted to, and they did. They learned how. They learned really flexible ways of describing structures. The way I've put it sometimes, Bertrand Russell set about trying to find a rigorous logical foundation for mathematics, a rigorous what we, type theory is, is what we call it now. He wanted to find a rigorous analysis of language. He found one, and it was hard. It took him 20 years of his life working with Alfred North Whitehead. Um, in, his, in the Schilp volume, this man named Schilp, he edited this volume about Bertrand Russell. He had Bertrand Russell write an autobiography, and he had about 20 people write essays about Russell. And then he had Russell write replies to these essays. 
Kurt Gittel wrote one of the essays and said that Russell doesn't know this about logic, and Russell doesn't know that about logic. And Russell's reply was, Gittel is obviously a very good logician, and whatever he says is probably true. And, one, and another one of the essays, I think it was Quine, wrote and said, Russell thinks that logic has to be like this, but I found out you can do it this other way. And Russell's reply to that was, it took me so long to understand this that I can't imagine any other way of doing logic. He said, this, is no, this does not prove there's no other way, but it proves that I cannot discuss the question. <laughs> When it was so hard for him to find that that he thought that might be the only way you could do it. And you can understand him thinking he thought it might be the only way to do it. It was the only way he found after looking for a long time. Over the next 30 years, people found various other ways. They invented Zermelo Frankel set theory, uh, Quine's new foundations, various articulations of the theory of types, algebraic logic. Over the next 30 years, various other logics were found. But what happened in the 1960s, because of category theory among many other things, people started to find lots of other ways. Lots of other ways. If you've only ever seen one rigorous analysis of logic, you could believe it's the only one. But if you've seen two, you cannot believe they're the only two. If there's two, there's got to be a lot. And we now know there's a lot. There are a lot more structures then you're going to get out of any one set theory. If philosophical logicians are looking for different kinds of structures, we want, hey, a, 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 a theory of identity. We don't want the classical theory of identity. We want to change the identity relation in some way. Maybe to suit quantum mechanics. This is a, a project some people have. Well, it's worth knowing today that there are lots of other theories of identity. Categories bring other theories of identity. Most famously now, homotopy type theory has a completely other notion of identity. We have a framework in which lots of theories of identity are given, lots of theories of structure are given. So insofar as philosophical logicians are looking for alternatives, maybe they want to look here. As I said on that other slide, um, you might, for example, you, you might look in topos theory. Toposes have lots of other... Toposes x equals y or x does not equal y is not true in every topos. You've got toposes where we say identity is not decidable. And for example, one of them is the topos of synthetic differential geometry. Have you ever seen calculus presented as saying, well, the derivative of f at x is equal to f at x minus uh, f, oh no, f at x plus h minus f at x all over h, where h squared equals zero. And h is a number so small that when you square it, it's zero. So we take this quotient, we ask how much did the function change when we changed it by this little amount, divided by the amount, where this amount is so small that the square is zero. This is not standard calculus today. But it was to Laplace, and actually, this is the model in, in the parts of math where, well, when, when we look at, at, when we look at a function, we say, Approximate every function, f of x is f of 0 plus x times the derivative of f at x. We take the first Taylor approximation to it. Well, we know there's a better approximation, x squared over 2 times the second derivative, oh, the derivative of 0, times the second derivative of 0. We have a Taylor series which might or might not converge to the function, might or might, but for a lot of functions it does. When we truncate at the first Taylor series, we're saying x squared equals zero. This is, this, taking first Taylor series is mathematics like that. Most mathematicians will say it's not rigorous. 
But in what's called synthetic differential geometry, we get a little interval around zero. It's a little interval around zero. It's so small that its square is zero. And we can show that if x, so if x squared is different from zero, then x is not an element of this interval. But it does not follow that for every x in the interval, x squared, uh, 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 yeah, it does not follow that x is zero. x is zero. Oh yeah, in fact, we can show more than that. Yeah, I'm sorry. We can show if x is not zero, then x is not in there. But it doesn't follow that every x in there is zero. Because we don't know that every x is either zero or not. The, the physical, the intuition here is, these are things that are vanishing. They're vanishing pretty fast. They're not different from zero. Things that are different from zero aren't vanishing. They're different from zero. But they're not equal to zero either, because they're vanishing, they're not gone yet. So we have these things that are, they're disappearing, but they haven't disappeared yet. And this theory is rigorous. We can give a rigorous theory called synthetic differential geometry. There's books about it. So here, x equals zero, or x does not equal zero, is not a theorem. We don't have that. Some things are equal to zero, some things aren't. But we don't have that everything is either equal or, not, or unequal. Yeah. Uh, does we have to invest as a theorem? Hmm? Does we have the negation of that as a theorem? Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is actually provable from the axioms. It, it's not the case that everything there equals zero. But it is true that anything that's not equal to zero is out of is not in there. Okay, and you say, well, but but what about we take a contrapositive? Um, so that says if x, if it's not the case that x is is not in there, then it's not the case that x is not equal to zero. Ah, we don't have double negation here. The law of double negation doesn't hold in this logic. This, this statement about double negatives is true, is provable, but it doesn't imply this statement. Yeah. Is it material human, the contents you stated here yeah. are similar to the uh, non-standard analysis? No, no, non-standard. have any relations? No, not, not in particular. No. Um, more than like, uh, Gonzalo Reyes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reyes has, has studied the relations to non-standard analysis. Non-standard analysis has standard logic. Um, this, in non-standard analysis, everything is either equal to zero or not equal to zero. Mm -hmm. But in non-standard analysis, the difference of zeros. Yeah, the question is, is the difference of something from zero, a, is the difference between them greater than a standard real? Non-standard, you distinguish standard reals from all the reals. All right. But you don't have a non-classical theory of identity. Um, you have you have sort of two real. You have the standard real line and the non-standard parts. Well, you have the real line and the standard part of that, but it's not all in the standard part. I think what we need to learn. From category theory, from categorical logic, and lots of other parts of logic, is that formal coming up with formal systems is really pretty easy. There's you can come up with formal systems. Now that doesn't mean it's easy to answer questions in metaphysics by formalizing them. In fact, it's the opposite. What that means is merely formalizing a metaphysical theory doesn't matter very much because formalization is pretty easy. The question is, is it a valuable formalization? Does it address some metaphysically important concern? 
but the formalization, I think, it's, philosophers need to get used to the idea, more used than they are, to the idea that formal systems per se are easy to create. There's vast numbers of them known now, which were not known 40 years ago. Right? They're known because of what happened 40 years ago. But in particular, topos logic is, is a higher order logic. Every topos has a higher order logic. Which means, I will, I will talk more about Kripke models in particular. Kripke gave models for first order intuitionistic logic. Those models are in, th are in fact easily recast as topos models. But the topos recasting makes them higher order, automatically gives you a higher order logic. So Kripke models in the topos setting become models of higher order intuitionistic, intuitionistic logic. Now, precisely because this is automatic, it may not be the higher order version you wanted. When you look at just the second order versions in, in was it Von Dahlen and Trollstra, Trollstra and I forget. Um, I mean, so you, you take a given Kripke model, build the topos around it, it will give you a higher order logic, which might not be exactly the one you wanted. So maybe you need to modify that topos model, or you might even decide the topos approach isn't helping. But you should know that there is at least one higher order extension of that, of, of that model, the topos model. Um, recursive analysis. No. Oh. Recursive logics. People give realizability interpretations. We want... Uh, Church's thesis. And what I'm going to write, I'm going to put a star on this because what I'm going to write is not actually Church's thesis. Every function f from the naturals to the naturals is computed by, I'm going to say by a Turing machine. Church's thesis has lots of versions. What are, what are, should we call this the church, the church Turing thesis? I don't care. Every, every function from the now is recursive. That's not what Church said. What did Church say? He said every, every effective function, every function that can actually be computed at all, can be computed by some Turing machine, or can be computed by some recursive algorithm. You, you have a, a choice of ways. But I put it this way, because you can build a topos where this is true. Every function, from the naturals to themselves, is computed by a Turing machine. Now, you know, we can prove by a diagonal argument that not every function can be recursive. But that diagonal argument doesn't work here. It draws on classical logic. It assumes, in particular, that any two numbers are either equal or different. By giving up the claim that either x equals y or else x is not equal y, by giving that up, you can't give the diagonal argument anymore. So this topos, every function is computed by a Turing machine. Um, when you read something like Hartley Rogers' book on recursive function theory, he never proves that a function is recursive. If it's a book on recursive function theory, he never proves that a function is recursive. He might prove if you are at the beginning. He says, I'm going to assume Church's thesis. He says, what he really means is, every function I talk about, I will have given you a definition. You can see from that definition that it's got to be machine calculable. Every time I, every time I show, give you a function, you'll know how to compute it. And you already know that if you can actually compute the function, it's actually recursive. And he's right. I mean, he does a good job. It's a great book because it's fair. It's not a confusion. It doesn't mislead you. He says right up front, if you want to be ultra-cautious, you really need to check a bunch of claims that I'm not even going to talk about. 
But what I tell you will steer you right. I will give you such clear instructions that it's kind of obvious how to build a turning machine to do it. Not in detail, but it's clear it could be done. But we've got to tell us, but this is literally true. Every function is, is computed by a turning machine. As of what happens, actually, this is a T and then an L. I'm sorry, that's not clear at all. When you give the recursive, when you give the diagonal argument, what you get is a function that might not be defined everywhere. As far as you know, it isn't defined everywhere. This, this, in, in this logic, what we call non-recursive functions appear in this topos as functions that aren't quite defined on the whole of the natural numbers. They're defined for every individual natural number but maybe not on the whole of the natural numbers. The image there is that the natural numbers in this topos, they're not a discrete series, one, two, three, four, and so on. They're a somehow, a somehow linked series. And non-recursive functions don't, lose, don't necessarily lose any numbers, but they lose some of the linking. In this topos, they come linked. Now, can I really make that precise? Can I tell you what I mean by linked? Yeah, I can. I can describe the effective topos to you. I don't propose to because it will take long. But I mean, but I've done it in print, and other people have given longer descriptions of it in print. Um, so we can we can tailor worlds where other things happen. And this, and all oh, right, the point I was getting at is this, people have slowly extended this to second order arithmetic and you're doing recursive, doing recursive analysis. Analysis is second order arithmetic, right? Analysis doesn't just talk about natural numbers, it talks about real numbers. What is a real number? It's a set of rationals, which after all, rationals are coded by naturals. Analysis is about sets of natural numbers. So they had taken their recursive analysis and a recursive arithmetic made a recursive analysis. But as soon as you build a topos in which this is true, you now have higher order recursive logic. Higher in every order. It might not be the one you want. But in, in fact, in this case, there were various notions of realizability that worked already down on the first and second order level. People gave different notions of how to interpret statements recursively. Every one of those notions gives a topos. If, if one doesn't give the topos you wanted, maybe another does. Further, you might modify the topos. You might want to say, oh, I don't want this whole topos. I only want the part of it that does such and so. Well, you, but the point, the, the point that I think all logicians then need to know is that, yeah, you can you can do this. There's, there are tools existing that are already there that will take any, any setting like this and make it a higher order logic, if that's what you want to do. And if they don't give exactly the one you want, it's a, it could be a start. We were talking some about what happened with intuitionistic logic in, in the Netherlands. Part of what happened with intuitionistic logic in the Netherlands was Eka Murdaik who took a bunch of Trollster's questions, which had seemed like really hard questions. Can you do this in, in intuitionistic analysis? Can you do that? Eko Mordaik swept these questions away by using methods related to this, by, by categorical methods. He just answered so many of the questions that were outstanding in the field that I think a lot of people said, oh, I'll let Eka do this. You <laughs> know? Um, other things happen too. Logic is it comes and it comes and goes. But um, so when people were asking, has anything come into logic from category theory? Well, yeah, the the, the current theory of models of intuitionism, both topological models and recursive models for intuitionism, because this stuff was invented to model intuitionistic logic. Kleinian invented it to model intuitionistic logic. Um, Huge progress in that has come straight out of category theory. Uh, something that I don't understand, but I know it to be true, is that the notion of a monster model in model theory came out of out of category, categorical thinking. But I don't understand monster model. Um, 
What I think uh, I'll mention the idea of a topos. This is an idea dear to me, and so. I'm going to start with Alexander Grotendieck. Some people spell his name in French. He was born in Germany. He was 10 years old when he left Germany. He started his career in Brazil. He, spoke, he used a German spelling. But uh, for Alexander, Alexander Grotendieck, he looked at I'm going to put this in quotes because you don't need to worry too much about it. The category of sheaves on a site. This was for technical purposes in algebraic geometry. And he said, this looks like the category of sets. Now, it didn't look like the category of sets to other people. It looked big and complicated. But what he meant by it was, well, it's got a terminal object, and any two things have a product, which is different from their disjoint union, which they also have. And you can interpret lots of math here. He said you can do a lot of mathematics inside this category. And what did that amount to? The sites he was interested in were these generalized geometrical spaces. And so the sheaves are like sets varying over those spaces. We can define groups living inside here, let's define a group the way we would in the category of sets. Well, that will turn out to look like a group that varies continuously over this space. Now, you might think that we're trying to do geometry, especially difficult geometry. We might want to look at, say, groups that vary across that space. We can do mathematics. We, from inside this world, we think we're doing ordinary math. But from outside, we see all of this is varying continuously over this space. Now, he needed this for technical purposes, but he said, you know, his conclusion was, this looks like the category of sets. You should just, you should just do mathematics in this environment. Lavier Bill Lavier says, yes, and here's why. Every one of these. Oh, I should have I should have put the uh, axioms of the category of sets. One has one. It has products. It has equalizers. It has function sets. Every one of these has things inside it that look like function sets. That was, that was a big discovery on Bill's part. Has truth values. You can interpret the idea of truth values in every one of these. They work out a little bit differently than in the category of sets. In particular, remember we had one extensionality. We had two arrows. If two arrows are different, they differ on some element. This, you don't have anymore in that set. And that makes a big difference. But it has, it has truth values, has infinity. Lots of math that doesn't, have, that doesn't happen to depend on this can be done in every one. These became 
the elementary topos axioms. These categories are called, such a category is called a topos, a Grotendieck topos. Grotendieck called it a topos, he named it topos. These are now called, well, any, any model of these axioms is now called an elementary topos. Lovier and Tierney. Actually, Lovier and Tierney did this together. Came with elementary topos. I can teach you elementary topos theory. I'm not, I cannot teach you Grotendieck topos theory. Actually, I could if you had a lot more time. Um, but uh, for that, I'll leave, it, I'll leave that to Grotendieck or Mackay and Reyes or, or lots of other books. Uh, these constructions are very complicated because they relate to concrete mathematics like number theory and geometry. The whole point is here, we're abstracting away from that. They're, they're simpler over here. Of course, they make less difference than over here. But one of the striking things about it, any elementary topos, I'll put it, I'll put it this way. If, a, if an elementary topos, well, suppose you have an elementary topos and you have a notion of set. We're not, we're not doing categorical foundations here. You've got a set theory. A set theory in which you're going to define these. Now you've got an elementary topos, and you know that for every set S, there is a copy of S inside here, then, you're, then it's one of these. As long as every discrete set, so this, this copy will be just a collection of dots. As long as you have an elementary topos, and for every set, there's a, an object that's just that many copies of one. Then it's a Grotendieck topos. These axioms, the axioms by themselves, cannot be equivalent to those because these axioms have no set theoretic strength at all. But if you add this set theoretic assumption, they are those. And this is... I'm not telling you that every problem in philosophical logic is solved by a topos. I am telling you this is a huge toolbox for prop solving problems in, in philosophical logic. And having, it, it, it has solved some, and it's a big existing theory. Let me explain Kripke models as topos models. with an ordered set of worlds. That's the point of S4, is that these are post-sets. A sheaf on a POSAD assigns a set to each, I'll call it each world, why not? I'm talking about Kripke models. So we have a set here, and a set here, and a set here, and a set here, and a set here. Uh, there and there, and set here, and set here, and set here, here, and here. So I'm putting 
indeterminate sets here and functions the other way. Between each of these sets, you have functions the other way. I've drawn this as if it's a discrete order, but we also require that these compose. You have to have that function, and you have to have that function, and you have to have that function. You have a function there, but you also have the composite, and you also have the function to there. A natural transformation of sheaves, well, it looks like natural transformations did before. If you've got one of these and you've got another, a natural transformation is a function from corresponding nodes here to corresponding nodes there that gets along with these arrows. If I move out here and then go down, that's the same as if I went down and then moved in there. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, you've got another sheaf, and then you put a function in each node that gets along with all the transition functions. The category of sheaves is a topos. It is a topos. So we have logic in that category. Kripke models are the case where, what are the, oh, um, I believe in Kripke models of S4, the, the transition functions are all inclusions. Things can come to exist at a later stage, but they can't get combined at a later stage. I think that's the case of, that's Kripke's idea for S4. When you pass, you, you've got a universe of all the things there are, and some, in a way the universe is constant. Oh, in fact, he may even, yeah, he may even say that the domain of his models is a constant sheaf. The same things exist in every world in a Kripke model. Is that, I think that's, so the same things exist in every world, but they don't all have the same properties. Properties can come to exist, but once a property has come to exist, it stays there. Or once a thing has come to have a property, it continues to have that property. The Kripke models are some of these sheaves, and his interpretation of logic for them is the, the topos logic. It's a, it, his Kripke models are a special case of these sheaves, but they do use, in fact, the topos logic. His models are first order log models, and that's because if he were to follow the topos construction of the higher order analog, the domains wouldn't stay constant. But we get higher, but we, in the topos of, of these sheaves, we get, we get here we get models for higher order intuitionistic logic. If you want models for higher order S4, then you need to restrict which sheaves you look at. Toposes are about variable sets. Grundy toposes are explicitly about variable sets, although the things they vary over can look a lot weirder than cosets. Grundy toposes are about variable sets. Kripke models turn out to be variable sets in that sense. Now, which do you want a Kripke model of is going to affect what you start with. Do you start with a... So in, in, this, in this picture, um, so S4 is the one where once something is possible, it's possibly possible, isn't that? And that's transitivity of these. That's why it's a post-set. Now, but this didn't have to be transitive, because you don't have to be doing S4. Um, S5, well, these all go both ways, and so it's S5 is really about it. about equivalent classes of, of worlds. <clears throat> so anyway, that's what I, what I wanted to say, was that uh, even substandard things that are, are standard in, in philosophical logic turn out to be, a forcing also turns out to be truth in a certain topos. Each, each individual set theoretic notion of forcing is truth in some corresponding topos. That's not to say that set theorists need to worry about that fact. I don't know if that fact cuts any ice in set theory. It is, however, a fact. 
And I, again, I'm not saying that people who want to study modal logic have to know that these extended topox models. I would suggest you should know the extended topox models. <laughs> the only ones for uh, for uh, and yeah, maybe maybe only for maybe the oh, that I can make it work for a week. You just have to reconceive it in some way. Maybe not. Do you have a way of saying that? No. no, I start with S4 because I'm happier with those X, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's true at all. I will give you the reference on this. Is Reyes and La Palme Reyes. Gonzalo Reyes and Marie La Palme Reyes. Um, I believe the book is called Pre Sheaf Toposis. I think it's called that. So, anyway, the authors I know the authors are Gonzalo Reyes and Murray Lapalm Reyes. I'm not going I'm not to show the title, but they, they would be the, the, the place to start with this. People in Montreal. Okay, well, thank you. A special thanks to the organizers for the opportunity, but thanks to all of you for the stimulation and the discussion. It's been, it's, it's been extremely educational for me. Yeah, more for us. Of course. <laughs> yeah, let's thank you. Discussion has worked well. Ah, yeah. People, anybody who wants to come up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so we've had some good questions from you. And then everybody gets to hear. Everybody learns if you ask your question now. Why is this called compost? Oh, um, oh uh, Grundig explains that. Because he says this is the correct generalization of topology. This is what topology ought to become now. Uh, basically because these things have cohomology. This is... He, what, he was, what he set out to do, he's trying to take cohomology from topology, make it apply in number theory. He says, what does cohomology really need? It really needs sites. It really needs the, what basic cohomology is this stuff. And so he says, this is really how we, what we should, topology should be dealing with from now on. It should not be about topological spaces, it should be about sites. Now, it might or might not be true, but he calls it topos for that reason. It is not the Greek word topos. Um, the other reason it's called topos is that if you're in high school in France, you will call an essay a topo. And so it's a, it's a joke about high school assignments in France. It's a French word, not a Greek word. The correct plural in English is toposis. Not topoi. Topoi is the correct plural of a certain Greek word that's spelled topos. But this isn't from the Greek word, it's from topology. <coughs> so the correct the correct plural is topos. But people argue about that, and I'm not really going to find anything like that. Topoi, good Greek plural, but you know this, you cannot learn English without learning other languages too. We can't keep English apart from other languages. Because we're too new. We, we, we weren't apart from other languages. Okay. <laughs> I think it's good time to go back to the title page. Oh, when you mentioned uh, something is easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I, oh. no, I didn't. Yeah. I, oh, second day I still have the title page. Yes. <laughs> See, I told you it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think maybe that not everyone uh, agrees, but at least I, 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 think, uh, I think most of us feel uh, your lecture opens the door for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least we learn what is the uh, functor and uh, uh, CFC is not the only set theory. And, uh, there are a lot of other ways to organize the mathematics. Yeah. Yeah.
And compared to mathematics as a whole, I mean, when, uh, precisely why I, why I put these people, given the tasks that it was set to achieve and did achieve, it's easy. It's the easy way. <laughs> yeah. And for me, uh, <laughs> Collins' lectures are like symphonies <laughs> of uh, mathematics, philosophy, and uh, history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like uh, what you have in classic music. Uh, sometimes you, you, you feel it's it's great piece of music, but uh, probably you need to come back to it to really understand if you learn something more about the structure of music. So I encourage you to come back to uh, Collins' lecture, the slides, the references, the, even the video, to enjoy the symphony more in the future. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks for being here. And, uh, yeah, I also would like to thank Jixin uh, for helping us out and the video stuff. We will put it online. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, let's thank Paul again. Uh, by the way, we uh, will have this uh, course on uh, quantum uh, logic uh, next week. Actually, the last lecture of the class will be about the categorical quantum. So probably so, yeah, something will happen there. Which relates to Bob. Yeah.